welcome to Career Takeoff, where you learn the latest about how you can get ahead in your career. I'm your host, Conrad Shaw. Welcome to this episode of Careers Takeoff. I'm your host, Conrad Chua, and it's great to see everyone back again after the summer break. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to remind everyone, put your questions in the comments field, whether you're watching us on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook. And you can start by writing down where in the world you're watching this from today. Now, wherever you are in the world, you're likely facing increased energy prices. You can see it everywhere in your monthly energy bills, at the petrol pump, and businesses also have to deal with uh, these higher energy prices. That's fed into uh, higher prices for customers, and in some cases, businesses have had to close. To find out what's happening and what can be done, we have Michael Pollitt, a faculty here at Cambridge Judge Business School, coach for the Energy and Environment Concentration for the MBA, and an assistant director of the Energy Policy Research Group here. So welcome, Michael. Hi, Conrad. So, Michael, um, first off, what's happening in terms of the energy prices? And just to illustrate this almost straight line cliff that's going way up, um, what's happened? Well, the fundamental problem in Europe has been a shortage of gas. Um, so that has driven up the the price of uh, gas for heating because um, we're looking at the household expenditure here. And it's also driven up the price of electricity because um, the marginal fuel in the wholesale electricity market is gas. Um, and so if the price of wholesale gas goes up, the price of wholesale electricity goes up. So it's the it's the background rises in the wholesale prices of gas and electricity in Europe that have uh, given rise to these very high rises in bills and even higher projected rises in bills. Um, the reason for the shortage in gas is, um, is mainly due to the um, uh, Russian-Ukraine war and the uh, interruption to gas supplies from Russia to Europe, um, but exacerbated by the recovery from uh, COVID globally in a sharp um, and initially unanticipated rise in uh, global gas demand. Mm. And obviously, this is something that's not uh, peculiar just to the UK. I mean, if you look at this chart here, electricity prices are high, all, have increased all the way, but the UK very much more than um, our friends across the channel. Why is it that the UK is facing so much, so, such higher prices, whether for electricity or here we can see for uh, less for gas? Um, well, I, I, I think there, I mean, the simple reason for that is that until recently, the UK was passing on the underlying wholesale rise in the price of gas to uh, retail customers. So even in the um, regulated tariff that most customers have defaulted onto for households, um, that was still a cost reflective um, tariff, even though it was fixed for six months. So, um, so what's mainly been happening is the UK has pa been passing this on to customers and uh, until recently was targeting um, giving people rebates or cash transfers to cope with their energy bills rather than interfering with the price. Whereas in, in uh, several other countries, the prices have been capped, most notably in France, um, and, and were capped earlier, or there have been interventions to reduce the price, as in, as in Spain, who've had an intervention at, uh, in the wholesale um, electricity market, limiting the, the price of, of, of gas produced electricity. Um, so that's the main reason um, why there's some of these big differences between the UK and, and other European countries. Great. And uh, you're an economist, so I kind of know where you'll be going to for uh, which direction, what direction you're going headed towards when it comes to prices and, and the clarity that price, price 
plays in terms of signaling to the markets. Before we go there, just to shout out to some of the people here we have today, we have Jet from Singapore, Eli watching us uh, on LinkedIn from Greece, someone's from uh, Pakistan, Beanish is from London, uh, Truella is from Brunswick in Germany, and obviously there's been big news from Germany just this morning about them taking over uh, an oil refinery, a Russian oil refinery. Someone's from Kuwait, uh, Vicky, who's a, an alum for, uh, watching us from Taiwan, Ardenum's in New York, so a very early morning, Lay Layla's working for us. Uh, we've got Samir in Cambridge. We have Kael from Stavanger in Norway. And of course, Norway is quite a big uh, oil, uh, sorry, energy producer as well. So, Michael, if we could talk a bit, if you can talk a bit about, actually, when it comes to the UK, what goes into the price that I pay at the, you know, every month to my energy supplier? Well, of course, this is a nice breakdown of um, of the components that make up the regulated tariff that people uh, have. Most people in the UK have now defaulted um, onto for gas and electricity. Um, and as you can see, that it, it didn't used to be the case um, that the wholesale element of that um, default tariff. Uh, was the majority of the bill, but it is now. And you can see that most of the rise in the bill that we've seen recently has been due to um, wholesale costs, which, as, I, as, as we were saying, um, is mainly about the wholesale price of gas for heating and the, uh, and the wholesale price of electricity, which is driven by the price of gas. Um, but you can see there are some other significant elements there. Uh, network costs are significant. You can, you know, if you look back to summer 2020 when wholesale prices were low, you know, network costs are of sort of a similar order of magnitude to um, the wholesale costs. So these, these are the charges that pay for the wires and the pipes that actually transport the electricity and gas to you. Um, and that's a very significant um, uh, part of the cost. Um and then there are some policy related costs. These are related to renewable subsidies and energy efficiency um, uh, payments. Um, and then there's the, you know, the operating costs of the retailers themselves. So the marketing um, and uh, billing type costs. Um, um, so, you know, most of those cost elements are uh, stable apart from um, the the wholesale cost. Um, people do get exercised about things like uh, VAT. So there's a five percent VAT on, on on electricity and and gas, and of course that goes up when the all the other components go up. Um, and um, certainly there's discussions about whether you know we should remove VAT um, because it's got this um, this sort of multiplier effect on underlying costs. So when you look at that chart with all these uh, colors, which is there any part that the government can actually is within the government's control? Uh, you mentioned VAT for one, um, but the big is it true? Is it the case then that the major part wholesale is completely outside government control? I, I think um, it's it is for gas largely. Um, you know, one can argue about that because, you know, Maybe 50% of UK gas um, does come from the UK continental shelf. Um, uh, but, you know, largely gas prices are, you know, European wide prices. Um, uh, some component of the wholesale cost of electricity is actually, you know, regulated by government because um, it's renewables or in the future nuclear which has been procured under some sort of long-term contract which is government backed um so you know new offshore wind uh, is being procured through an auction being run by the government to procure that offshore wind at 
uh, affects price and those prices have been way below the, the prices that we've seen recently in the wholesale market. Um, but there's already a mechanism by which that uh, that difference between the, the wholesale price driven by gas and prices of um, renewables procured under long term contract um it, that that difference is already recycled back to consumers and is already having some small re, uh, role in reducing the price that we would otherwise be paying um so the government has a limited influence on the wholesale uh, cost though that might increase in the future um it re the the network charges are regulated on the basis of the asset uh, base of the network companies they they get an assessed regulatory rate of return on their um, predicted costs um so that's you know that's decided by off gem it's n not not easy for the government to influence that directly um mm. vat could be removed um, there's certainly been talk about re removing the policy costs and putting moving those to general taxation, um, and certainly the you know there seems to be some appetite among the current government to do that, um, and some discussion about well is it fair that policies which are yielding wider environmental benefits are financed wholly actually wholly from the electricity bill in 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 a lot of in a lot of cases even though you know gas com customers are all rel are also creating environmental damage um so one one could argue about that the the other element that has been quite controversial is um there is quite a large payment at the moment to finance the losses of bankrupt um retail companies um and uh if if a retailer goes bankrupt at the moment it goes in, into a bankruptcy regime and those costs are re recovered from um the the other customers which of course that that doesn't necessarily seem that fair um that you penalize the customers of the non-bankrupt custom uh bankrupt uh, retailers um, and you've got yeah. the example there of bulb energy, which was the biggest failure. That failure was so big that actually the taxpayer had to uh, take over bulb energy and it, it wasn't put through the conventional bankruptcy regime. Mm. So um, for those who don't, who are not aware, this is, you know, the UK had a, quite a number, had a quite, I would say quite a large number of uh, energy suppliers. And as prices went up, um, the price cap didn't go up quite as quite as quickly, I guess, and some of these suppliers had to fold. Um, with this, I guess this is the the chart that shows that quite a number of suppliers actually had to leave the market. I think Ofgem puts it very uh, euphemistically as exiting the market, but it was quite painful for customers and the companies, shareholders, and the employees, of course. Um, Michael, is this a case where the market, you know, the price, there was a big dis disconnect between the price that, between the prices that these suppliers had to pay for a wholesale price and the prices that they could charge customers. And that's what happened here. That's certainly a big part of it, because as uh, w what was happening was that most customers buy their electricity and gas on a one-year contract with a one-year fixed prices um what a lot of these um bankrupt suppliers appear to have been doing is buying their electricity and gas in the wholesale market on a one-month contract so of course that meant that as prices started to uh, rise in the wholesale market they couldn't put up their prices to their uh, customers to to reflect that um, and basically they had a, a very ineffective hedging strategy um, and the suppliers that went um, bust were the ones that didn't either hedge properly or um, didn't own their own generation if they were you know in the electricity market because if you were 
um, a large company that also owned its own generation. Of course, you were physically hedged. You didn't have to be financially hedged because you were physically hedged. Um, so um, this lack of either physical or financial hedging was certainly a big contributor to um, these bankruptcies. Now, I think it is worth saying that, you know, as a, as an economist, you, you you know, one one was always a little bit uncomfortable when Ofgem said, oh, the, the GB market's going great. We've got, you know, 50, 60, 70 competing suppliers. Well, as, an, as you would learn on your MBA, you know, 10 equally sized companies would competing against each other. That's a really competitive market. So what's the be- what's the advantage of having 50, 60? <laughs> you know, actually what some of what was going on was we were subsidizing competition that um, some of these small suppliers were exempted from certain charges um, that other large suppliers had to uh, had to, had to pay for, and actually the the competition of many of these entrants was subsidised. Um, so one can argue that seventy, fifty, sixty was not the right number, but one certainly has to pay attention to uh, the fact that so many left the market so quickly. Um, as a result of poor hedging strategies, um, albeit under exceptional rises in the underlying wholesale price. Yeah, I was always surprised every time my contract came to an end and I was shopping around for the next deal. Um, all these companies I never heard of and everyone was just competing on price when actually everyone's getting the same, well, pretty much, very much the same thing, isn't it? input price so uh yeah i never understood how we could support all these suppliers and what was the actual differentiating kind of uh, factor that from a competition point of view well i think i think that is a good question and of course you know a key potential subsidy of the system to these suppliers was the fact that there was a bankruptcy regime where you knew, Conrad, that if you signed up with um, an energy company you never heard of, that, you know, you're, even if they went bust, your supply would not be interrupted and you wouldn't, um, you know, you wouldn't fa- necessarily face a financial penalty for having um, signed a contract with a risky um, supplier, whereas you know those of us who've been, as I've been, um, you know, customers of airlines that have gone bankrupt. We, you know, we just lost the tickets that we bought. You know, we weren't bailed out. Whereas, of course, that's not the case in energy. Even your credit balance is transferred um, to to a new supplier, and you don't lose any credit you've got with a bankrupt supplier. Mm. Well. Michael, I should say that I was very careful in always looking at the financials of of energy companies that I signed up with. Uh, We have one question here from uh, Mo, who asks, like, who determines the 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 external price? You know, is it producer or energy producing countries? Is it these large multinationals? Um, How how is the price sort of um, derived? And I guess this question is co- quite a complex one because ultimately we're talking about what, who, are the mar- who are the market players and how do they all interact with government to come up with the final price that I see at the, at the end of the month. Is that, is, that, is that right? Okay. So, this, of course, this is a great question and the sort of question that, you know, you, you know somebody who's doing an MBA really we, will get some good insights onto. Um, uh, you know, it depends how competitive the wholesale market is. So if you think about something like the global oil market, the global oil market is pretty competitive apart from, as we all know, um, you know, OPEC do run a cartel and they do try and restrict output of OPEC members in order to influence the global price. Um, but, you know, it, from the perspective of individual countries there is a global oil market 
you know, and so OPEC does have an influence on global supply, but actually the price of the wholesale price of crude oil is pretty much the same transport adjusted in every country in the world. Um, you know, so, so that, you know, which is great. Um, gas, it's a, it's, it, it, you know, is more, is a more interesting market because it divides into liquefied natural gas and pipeline gas and the cost of uh, converting gas to, uh, to a liquid is are, are really quite high. So that means that um, although there is, a, you know, increasingly a global price for liquefied natural gas, um, there are still regional prices for pipeline gas. Um, so, you know, and that's why we see very low, you know, relatively low prices for pipeline gas in the United States versus for pipeline gas in, in Europe. So what so what you have in are these regional markets where the prices can be quite different for gas. And within the regional market that is Europe, Russia and Gazprom are very big um, uh, you know, suppliers to that market. And as we saw before, the you know the supplies were really reduced in Europe. You know, Gazprom was almost able to turn turn the supply down and get the price to go up by more than uh, their volume reduction and and actually increase their revenues. Um, so they had you know real market power there um, because of their you know very large share of European gas in this. Um, differentiated global gas market um in electricity the the constraints in electricity are interesting because it's quite expensive to build interconnection between different countries uh and again we see uh, quite a bit of potential differentiation in prices even between france and the uk um uh once you uh, you hit the capacity of the interconnection between the two um, so the price can be the same as long as you are not fully utilizing the interconnection capacity. Um, um, but often they are different. Mm. And I think there's also been um, in the media a lot of question, questions about why is it that my electricity price is determined by gas in the, you know, sometimes it's linked to gas when if I recall, some of these energy supplies, I don't know if they're still around, some of them would say they were completely getting from renewable sources or largely from renewable sources. So why is it that if I'm buying, if my energy supply is buying mostly from wind, solar, um, that their prices can be, so, can be the same as everybody else? Yeah, well, of course, that, that's, you know, that's a great question. And, it, and it's a simple um matter of of the fact is that the price in a in in a market is determined by that last unit that is sold so you know if in order to make supply equal to demand i need to produce one very expensive unit then every unit gets paid that amount so it's so as long as we're in a market where there's a single price and supply and demand have to be equal, then it's that last unit that you need to satisfy demand, which is determining the price for everyone. And because, you know, uh, gas is in the UK, it's 40% of, of electricity production. It's the most, you know, currently the most expensive of the major technologies to produce. But of course, it is that it's in that last uh, unit of energy is coming from is coming from gas to satisfy demand and hence it's the cost of producing electricity in the gas fired power plant that is determining the price for everybody um uh yeah so that's you know that's the that's the straightforward reason why uh gas is driving the electricity price yeah justin uh on youtube is asking so is there any what can we do in the medium term? Obviously, in the short term, we are, we're stuck, right? We can't really shift that supply too much. But is there a replacement for gas in the medium term? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a great question. 
and I, I, you know, I've been involved in some modeling work of, you know, what would the European energy system look like in 2050, even if we hit the net zero decarbonization target? And the answer is, is there's still gas in the system, you know, so that so uh, the question is, what's it doing? You know, um, well, either it's, you know, we're using gas and we're, uh, you know, decarbonizing it and to produce hydrogen so we can split the methane and get the hydrogen out and capture the co2 um uh, you know and 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 that that type of hydrogen is going to then compete with um a hydrogen that's been produced directly from electrolysis um so so these these green and blue or whatever color you want to call it hydrogens will compete with one another and but methane is still there you know could because there's so much methane available it's going to be used in a lot a lot of the world anyway and so gas is still going to be part of our energy mix it's still going to be contributing to the price of energy now of course the hope is that if we can get the demand for methane down because it is competing with hydrogen from uh, electrolysis, um, then of course the pr the underlying wholesale price of the gas will be low, you know, and we won't be in the situation at the moment where um, methane uh, produced conventionally is in short supply. It'll be competing with alternative sources of energy such as hydrogen from electrolysis but we'll still need some um you know easily storable high density fuel um which has properties that look a bit like methane um mm. so you know it's still very difficult to imagine a complete electrification of the energy system um that looks you know the modeling says that's very unlikely and technologically probably impossible um yes we'll see a lot more electrification but we'll still still be using some sort of gaseous fuel and mm -hmm. if we're doing that methane will still be in the mix somewhere we have a couple of questions i think well, a lot of it about um regulation and market design so daniel one of our alums um asked is it fair to say that liberalization did not survive its first real test? And what are some market design lessons from all this? Something quite philosophical there, Michael. Yeah, well, Daniel's a good, good friend of mine and, uh, um, and we've been working closely together. Um, so lovely to hear from, from him. Um, is it, you know, is it's first real test? I mean, you put, you put that chart up at the beginning, um, I, you know, I um and and Daniel knows I've written about this recently. What is the situation we're in at the moment? You know, we've had a rise in the real price of both gas and electricity, which is off the charts historically. You know that you know you you've drawn it there. Uh, you know, I went back through the numbers. So the previous largest rise in the real price of electricity in one year in the last 100 years was 18 percent and the previous largest rise in the real price of heating uh, fuel was 29 percent you can see there it's more than doubled in one year <laughs> so you know um so this is a test like we've never seen before OK, it would be the first thing. And, and, it, and it is, we're, you know, we're in a war situation where our enemy has actually just cut the supply of gas. OK, it's irrational long term for them to do that. Didn't happen throughout the Cold War. You know, the gas was flowing. Um, but you know, we are in a, an exceptional situation. So, you know, the question is, do we need some non-market intervention in an exceptional situation or can the, you know, can the market handle this? And I, I, I think, you know, as an economist, you've got to know, you know, your limits. You know, I, I would never say 
it's the market at all costs. And, you know, as, you know, um, we face an existentialist threat, we just refuse to use anything but the market to meet it. I mean, that I, 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 I don't think that's wise to do that. Um, so I think we can contemplate interventions that we wouldn't normally contemplate when we're faced with price rises that are this big. Um, uh, I think the good lesson that we've learned, to the second part of your question, is, you know, one of the reasons why supply of gas and supply of electricity has been maintained in Europe in the face of a lot of turbulence is because of the single market in electricity and gas. You know, it's this sharing of gas and electricity across Europe. The fact that it is basically a big single price area where prices do move together. Um, that has really improved individual countries' energy security. Um, you know, and, and in a sense, Russia hasn't been able to target individual countries with through the single market. Um, and, and so that's, you know, a major advantage of the wide area market. So mm. uh, I think one of the big lessons of this is whatever we do to intervene, we shouldn't fundamentally destroy the single market area in gas or electricity. Mm. And um, another question here. Well, I was going to show this uh just this picture, this is from Texas about a year and a half ago when obviously they, they suffered this big um, uh, unexpected cl climate with very cold climate that knocked out power. And because Texas is separate, is the one state that's not connected to anywhere else, um, they, they had all these outages, even though I, I think Texas as a state is one of the largest energy producers in the world, and yet they still face this challenge. So um, I think your point is a very strong one about being part of that interconnection. Um, yeah, and, uh, and, from... and yeah, which the other great example of that is, um, you know, the Fukushima crisis in Japan, mm -hmm. where Japan doesn't have a single electricity market. <laughs> um, you know, it's got these two... Um, uh, two frequency areas um, which are only very weakly interconnected in the east and west of Japan and that and so um, you know even though the eastern area was short of electricity there was electricity in the western area that could have in theory been exported to the east um, but because mm. of the shortage of interconnection capacity um, and the sort of weak interconnection between the two that worsened the crisis Okay. Yeah, and I remember going to Tokyo about a year after Fukushima and everyone was still pretty much having practicing some kind of energy rationing uh, mm -hmm. as they came to grips with that. Um, coming back to this question from someone on LinkedIn about price caps. Uh, price caps don't allow demand destruction and the market to efficiently solve the problem. We saw these problems in Spain. So is a price cap the right thing for the UK? I mean, it's a, this is a great question because, um, yeah, you know, the, the great thing about the market is it will always make sure that supply equals demand, in at least in theory, okay? Um, and, you know, in, in theory, um, you know, as you allow the price to rise, the, 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 the demands which value the energy less than the price will drop off the system now of course that's not that's not always true okay that is not always true um but partly because there are multiple market failures around energy one of the key ones being that the people who make energy consumption decisions aren't necessarily the people who are paying for it so you know one would like to think that um, as the price went up, people realized that their use of energy wasn't actually that valuable and they would switch it off. But but often, of course, that isn't what's actually happening at the individual consumption decision um, mm -hmm. uh, point. Um, so, I, you know, I completely agree that it's good that we signal um, 
that uh, demand should be destroyed. But but often, you know, that's a very imperfect signal. And, you, and we're seeing that at the moment, you know, the failure to get electricity and gas demand down in the household and commercial sectors because people aren't conscious of their energy consumption um, means the prices, you know, have gone up uh, enormously for industry and industry has had, I mean, in large ways of European industry have just had to switch off and not produce anything. And that's clearly, you know, you might say, well, that's just the market. It's efficient, but, but it's the market characterized by a lot of market failure. Um, so, um, so one has to think, you know, more carefully about combining price signals um, with, you know, protecting certain customers. Um, mm. You know, and 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 I think that is the issue, and and also I, you know, I think we, the rise in the in the price for households is just so great that the government has to intervene. Uh, on the mm -hmm. price somehow um and you know we've we've got this paper which you just produced at eprg where we said look what what households are concerned about is their bill they're not actually that concerned about what they're paying for their last unit of energy so what we, what we need to do is continue to incentivize people to actually turn their lights off reduce uh, de devices on standby install energy efficient light bulbs turn their heating settings down um because they will save money if they do that but what we want to do is take away the worry that they have of their total bill payment um and and that's about somehow exposing people uh for that last unit of energy to a higher price which reflects the underlying market price while you know reducing keeping their overall bill payment down so, so I think some sort of price control is okay, but what we need is a is is an intelligent price control, which, if you like, caps the average price, but doesn't fail to expose the uh, customers to the marginal, very high price of energy. And just on that point, I think Michael, uh, you were talking about this paper that you just uh, the the. EV the, the group that you're part of, the Energy Policy Research Group, uh, has put up, and that contains more information about uh, what, what you've been talking about in terms of the policy kinds of uh, recommendations. And if anyone wants to go, the QR code is there, you can zap that, uh, yeah, and take a look. It's, it's well, well worth uh, reading. So far, Michael, we've been talking a lot about the UK, Europe, but Justin again, uh, on YouTube is asking, what about um, third world governments, right? How are they, what, what do you feel they should be doing uh, policy-wise to, in the face of this energy crisis? And Justin, I think, is watching from Sri Lanka. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, my heart goes out to Justin. Um, you know, I, I, I think we... Uh, in advanced countries, you know, we're, you know, we're in the luxury position where we can just go, oh, well, let's have a policy where we, you know, cap everybody's bill um, and we put a lot of money into the system. At least we can do that for a, sh a short run, a uh, short time. But of course, one of the implications of doing that is to drive up the global price of energy. You know, if European consumers are protected from any price signal to reduce consumption um, and they're not really exposed to the global shortage of energy, then of course it's poor consumers in developing countries that end up paying higher prices for gas on global markets or higher prices for oil uh, on global markets. Um, so I think you know one of the things that can be done is that richer countries need to be responsible in the way that they um, you price energy and you know, ration energy, their own energy consumption. I think poor co countries need to ha follow good principles. One of the interesting principles is that is that if that energy consumption is actually very uneven in many developing countries, and actually, when you protect the price of energy, you know, like protecting the price of gasoline, is actually a really dumb policy in a developing country 
because of course it's richer people who have cars it, you know in, even more so than in in advanced countries so um i think certain things are obvious like you wouldn't uh, regulate the price of gasoline um and that you'd be if you did have some targeted subsidies they would be uh, strictly limited in quantity and they would be targeted on the poorest in society um you know it, it, you know it is a good idea to develop your economy on the basis of assuming that you're going to face world prices of energy um it is a really bad idea to develop your economy on the basis of subsidized energy which you're importing from abroad mm. yeah and I, I think the, uh, the other part about this is after a while it becomes a very political issue because people are used to subsidized fuel, for example. Um, I mean, you mentioned about that uh, as an economist, it's a dumb policy to subsidize oil price or petrol. But uh, the, the reality is that in many countries, that's what happens. And uh, I, I know uh, just coming, I was in Indonesia recently and they've spent billions every year because... They're locked into this cycle of subsidizing prices for diesel, for the motorcyclists, scooters, etc. that no government can actually pull back without losing elections. Um, we have this one other question here from Ilona. And Ilona wants you to uh, put on your forecasting hat here and say, well, where is the next challenge going to be <laughs> after, after we've had the pandemic all in get you know this energy crisis uh, is there something else around the corner that we sh we need to be worrying about <laughs> i hope not <laughs> um uh i mean this is a great question i i you know one of the reasons why i love the judge is is because it's a place where the world comes together and i think one of the things that we as a sort of global community ought to be thinking about is you know, we're not going to deliver net zero unless geopolitics improves. You know, I, I, I think what we've seen recently has been the weaponization of gas and the weaponization of climate policy. You know, China breaking off uh, relations with the US over climate. And I, th and I think we need to dial down the rhetoric <laughs> And realize that there are certain things that should be kept out of the um, geopolitical uh, machinations if we've, we're to have any hope of dealing with the climate crisis. Um, we, you know, we need to get back to a world where we're cooperating on energy and climate. And that energy is an example of global integration where we, you know, we realize our mutual interdependence both on the supply side. And on the demand side, you know, Russia is realizing that it was actually dependent on Europe for getting paid for its energy. Um, and also it's, you know, it's demonstrated itself to be a really unreliable supplier of energy to the rest of the world by doing what it's done to Europe. So, you know, we need to get back to the old world where we cooperated on energy and climate. Mm. Thank you so much, Michael. On that note, you know, which is mix of uh, optimism and re pragmatism, I guess. Um, just a reminder, you can find out more about the work that, the, that Michael and his colleagues at the Energy Policy Research Group does. Uh, he, they've just posted this paper on the energy price guarantee in the UK. You can um, click on the QR code there uh, and it will get you straight into the, uh, the paper. So just to let you know that our next episode is this time next week, 23rd September, 12.45 p.m. UK time. We'll be looking at the post-truth world and social media. So please join us there. And it just leaves me now to thank Michael for sharing his insights. Um, we definitely need to go in with our eyes open in terms of uh, the energy transition that everyone needs to make and hopefully we will be able to come out maybe this time next year in a much stronger position globally in terms of energy usage uh, a more efficient energy usage thank you so much michael thank you